Welcome to the Long Thread Podcast about spinning, stitching, and weaving by hand. This series is sponsored by Long Thread Media, publishers of Spin Off, Piecework, and Handwoven magazines. Find us online and subscribe at longthreadmedia.com. I'm your host, co founder Ann Marrow. In this episode, Linda Ligon interviews weaver and author Deborah Chandler. Linda will introduce Deborah, but in case you're not familiar with Linda Ligon's name, you're definitely familiar with her work. She's the founder of Interweave, the founder of Thrums Books, and a co founder of Long Thread Media, where her unofficial title is Instigator in Chief. Uh, I'm Linda Ligon, and I'm here with Deborah Chandler on my dining room table, which is currently my home office for Long Thread Media. If you've been a weaver for very much time at all, you probably are very familiar with Deborah's name and perhaps her work. She's the author of the very best-selling book, Learning to Weave, which has taught countless, countless people to weave well. And she also was an original columnist in Handwoven Magazine when we started the magazine in 1979. And she had a column in there every issue for at least 10 years. And it was called Your Weaving Teacher. Welcome, Deborah. Thank you, Linda. It's nice to be here. So, um, 10 years worth of columns, cranking them out every two months, pretty much on schedule, with all kinds of excellent advice for hand weavers, beginning and intermediate and experienced. How did you do that? For a long time, it was easy, but there were months when it was like, oh, cripes, what am I going to talk about now? Uh, I think it helped that I was teaching, and so as my students had questions for me, that gave me the ideas for what I needed to write. So, that so was a what, what's a good example of that? Can you remember way back then? The very, I remember when we did the very first one. It was like, okay, where do we begin? This is the beginning. So we started with fibers mm-hmm. and yarns and just talking about that. And from there, I'm, I am very structure-oriented and how does it work oriented. Not yeah. only in my weaving, but in everything. Yeah. But uh, I, I learned, I was really bad at teaching myself to weave. So I learned early on that a big piece of it was understanding the loom and understanding mm-hmm. the yarns and discovering that each yarn behaves differently. Mm-hmm. Each kind of loom has different strengths, different things it does best. And so I think mostly it was a process of explaining those things, pointing out the differences and what I always wanted for my students was that they would, is that I would send them off into the world with some grasp of what was actually going on so that then they would have room to experiment. I remember reading something that Georgia O'Keeffe wrote and she said that for her, art school was her time to learn the medium, to learn how different kinds of brushes worked and different kinds of paints and different kinds of things you paint on and all of those basic skills so that when she left art school, then she could become an artist because the tools were not a mystery to her and she wasn't trying to do something and something else happened. And with me, in the very beginning, it, all these, what little there was in the way of literature I found said, here, do this and after this, your imagination is the only limitation. And it became clear immediately that I had no imagination because I was only <laughs> making really terrible stuff. Um, and, and having discovered that that was not true, what I wanted to... Sh- help people find was the tools to do what they wanted to do. So really treating it as a craft. You learn the craft Mm -hmm. and then you practice the art. Yeah. Is that kind of how that goes? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you were doing a lot of teaching, Mm -hmm. uh, one-on-one teaching or one-on-group teaching. And so you had the opportunity to encounter all kinds of, all kinds of uh, questions from your students, all kinds of Mm-hmm. Vast seas of ignorance, I might say, <laughs> not in an insulting way, but it's uh-huh. just like weaving can seem pretty mysterious when one's beginning. Yes. And how did you how did you help people 
kind of in, in person teaching, how did you help people come to terms with that? Just helping them relax and take it in. I think probably it was a combination of respect and love saying to them, there's nothing wrong with you because you don't understand this. Nobody understands this in the beginning. And here's how it works. And yes, you can do this. And if something goes wrong, it's the thing going wrong, not you going wrong. I think that was most of it. Did you ever have a student that you just couldn't teach? I had one once who almost, it was a one week class. This was one of the most manic people I've ever met in my life. During that one week, she put on something like 40 warps and they were maybe two inches wide but she was moving so fast, she could not hold still, that I figured out by the second day that I had, at any given time, about a 45 second window to talk to her. If I could get an idea across in 45 seconds, she would get it. If it took any longer than that, she was gone already. That might have been the most challenging one. Indeed it would be. It was, it was. And by the end of the week, she had grasped a few concepts, and she, obviously, she could warp a little bit because she was, you know, doing that. Um, I wouldn't say she went away with a great understanding of the whole thing, but she was having a great time. Yeah, well, good. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, fun is a big part of it, isn't it? It's yeah. absolutely a big part of it. So, yes, fun, I hope. Uh, fun is a great part of it, and certainly can be. And two of my favorite people, weavers, I ever, or moments I remember was, one was a student who the assignment was design something. And she was an engineer, and she commuted with a car full of engineers every day for an hour each way. And she came back the next week with a design for a hot air balloon. And included, because she was an engineer, included things like, because it's woven out of this particular kind of cotton, by the time it's that big, it's going to weigh hundreds of pounds. So therefore, it needs to be bigger to have enough gas in it to be able to lift it. Just, I mean, it was pure this fun. This is a beginner weaver? This was a be well, it was a beginner weaver, but an engineering brain. Yeah. So the designing part, she did later weave a little balloon. We told oh, her I she remember. needed to weave one. Right? I remember Actually, it well. it was in handwoven. We right. published it in handwoven. It was really fun. attractive and fun. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. And the other one was a woman who, in fact, was a rocket scientist. And she came to the Guild fashion show in black tights and her handwoven underwear that was on top of her black tights. And it was just so, and I loved it, I loved it. And most weavers don't have quite that much fun, but yes, absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. Okay, so <laughs> those would not exactly be your assignments, but, no. but they just happen when they people turn themselves loose. Yeah. 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 So, so that's your, that, those are good examples of you as an in-person teacher. But when you were writing your columns for a magazine, it was you and, a, and probably a yellow legal pad or something like mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. How, that's a different kind of dynamic. It is. But it was a long time ago. Probably what I did was just imagine that I was talking to my class. Uh -huh. Maybe to a particular person, but usually to two or three who were coming at it from different angles. Yeah. Um, People say all the time that my writing sounds just like me. Yeah. And I, I don't actually know how to make it any different. So I just talk to my class saying, all right, this is what we're going to talk about now. Yeah. And then I write it down. So over the years, over all those years, what do you think are the maybe the most important or the best things you could suggest for your students to take away? What, what are your favorite Tips, hints, advice, teachings. All those yeah, things? All those things that you did. Can I do lots? Uh, well, <laughs> can, I can punch the button. There we go. <laughs> okay. One is, I think people should take at least two different beginning classes. Really? Yes, because each teacher is going to have a different way of presenting the information. Mm -hmm. So one will go warp, one will warp back to front, one will warp front to back. And each one will have her reasons for doing that. And all of the other things that she talks about, you know, I can only say X number of things in my week of class or hour of class or whatever it is. And somebody else will have different things to say, all of which are valuable and good. 
I've discovered that there's very little in weaving that's absolutely right or wrong, but there's a whole lot that's easier or harder. And, and one of the things that each weaver needs to decide for herself or himself is which ones are easier or harder for him or her. And I have an example in my class that I can't do on, without video, but my thumb, my thumb doesn't touch the palm of my hand when I fold it in. Other people's thumbs do. Hmm. So if you are holding the cross to slay the reed, you can lift threads off with your thumb. I would no more do that than I would fly to the moon. It would destroy the cross in a second because I can't do it. Well, that's interesting. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. So, so lots of things like that. Um, it, sort of like that is the whole, when I started weaving, it was a, a raging debate whether which was better, back to front or front to back warping. And the truth is, neither one is better. Each one is its own way, and there are maybe half a dozen different cases where one or the other is better, but in most cases, it doesn't make any difference. So whichever one you learned first or like better or feels more comfortable, do that. So really, it's just a matter of getting all of those, all of those little threads through all of those little slots and holes. That's right, yeah. right, a at the same tension. Yeah. Keep that oh, well, one in mind. Yeah, that's, that's good. That's good. <laughs> yeah. And so some people are much happier front to back, and other people are much happier back to front. Mm -hmm. Whichever one you like, yeah. do that. Yeah. Well, that's yeah. a good one. Okay. Yeah. Um, a big one is that it's when you first realize that you can't learn it all, that's kind of overwhelming. And then it gets to be very freeing, because what it means is if you can't learn it all, then you don't have to learn it all. So you can put all your energy into the kinds of weaving that are most exciting to you. But that said, the more you learn about different things, the better you'll be at problem solving. Because something from category A may solve a problem in category Q that you hadn't thought of until there you were facing that situation. And I also found that all the things that I didn't really like or wasn't that really interested in, wasn't that interested in, um, it turned out it was because I didn't know enough. And when I oh, was suddenly sitting yeah. and listening to a lecture and learning about it, it was like, whoa, that's really cool. And so then I would learn a little more. It didn't mean I needed to go do it. Yeah. But at least it was no longer on my I don't like it list. It was on my wow, that had a lot of things to teach me also list. Even if it was just a two-hour lecture at a guild, I learned something that I could then use. Well, that's a really expansive and positive way to think, but I, I do have a question. Uh -huh. Is there any kind of weaving you just really don't like? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> there is. Are you going to tell? Do you want me to? <laughs> yeah, I do. Um, I started out weaving on a rigid heddle loom, and it was horrible. It mm -hmm. was awful. Partly, we're talking early mid-1970s. The looms were nothing were not like good. the looms now. Yeah. They were not good looms. That didn't help. Second, I had no teacher. And third, what I learned later was, I'm not a design person, a tapestry person. I can't draw anything that anybody would recognize. And I'm not a color, fluffy yarn. I mean, that just isn't my world. And when weaving got good for me was when I had a teacher and a four harness loom. So you could do structures. So I could, could do structures. So I could yeah. play around. What it was was I'm a really great mechanic. I am not mm -hmm. an artist, but I'm a great mechanic. Mm -hmm. And I could take these harnesses and heddles and treadles and all that kind of stuff, and it's like, wow, look at all this cool fabric I can make, and it looks like I'm an artist, even though I'm really a mechanic. And I loved that. And I still love that. Yeah. No, that's great. And I yeah. have seen a lot of your fabrics that just exemplify that. Yeah. yeah. So it's fun. Yeah. So I admire those, I, and I love the new rigid heddle craze. I think that's the greatest yeah. thing in the world, and it makes me smile a lot yeah. um, for a lot of reasons. But I think it, and I think it's a great way for a lot of people to get into it, yeah. who especially who are into color and texture and right. all that. Or picking up, p p doing pickup. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yes. Because you can do any kind of structure oh. in the world on a rigid heddle. Right. There are tons of things you can do, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So pick up and... and f brocade and all kinds of things and I'm and I'm a big fan of those I just yeah. don't want to do them myself understood understood so well, what's another takeaway or tip that you would like to okay share um samples that's always a biggie right oh yeah so I learned to do samples as disaster prevention mm -hmm. and in that sense they're great they are not a money costing or time costing element they are a money saving 
and time-saving element. I have saved hundreds of dollars by doing samples first, and I have lost hundreds of dollars by not doing samples first. Mm -hmm. I can relate to that. Yeah, I imagine many people can. Um, but in addition to that, one of the other great weaving teachers out there told me that, or I learned from her, that the other reason to do samples is, so I have this idea, and I'm trying it out, but I have an extra 12 inches to play around with. I can try a different treadling, or I can try a different color combination, and holy cow, this is even cooler than what I had in mind. Yeah. And so it's not only disaster prevention, it's also expansion of ideas to come up with some really nifty stuff that I hadn't thought of at all. Yeah. Okay, it's after the fact. Yeah, well, it, it's true. I mean, sampling is something a lot of weavers sort of approach with dread because Resist. they want to get there right. in a hurry. Well, yeah. and another plus to it could be the more times you warp a loom, the faster you'll get. Yeah, that's true. And so the first time anybody came into our shop and said she wanted to buy a small loom because she wanted to do samples, I thought she was out of her mind. And later, I thought this was the smartest person I had met. And mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I did find out, though, also, I mean, the advantage of being in the weaving shop all those years was to get to use a lot of looms and play around a lot. And it takes a tiny bit more yarn to do a sample on a floor loom and is a whole lot faster. So in fact, don't think that if you only have a floor loom, you can't do samples because mm -hmm. you can, and it really doesn't take much more yarn, hardly any more. Um, so you mean just put on a longer warp and mess around with it? Or what, no. what are you talking about? No, I'm talking about... You it, put on a sample I can warp. still put on a one-yard warp onto oh. a foot loom. Yeah. And get easy 12 inches out of it, if not more. Yeah, sure. So, and which may be enough. Depending how big a sample needs to be depends on what you're sampling for. Sure. If you're only trying to mix colors, you can do that on a ruler. Right. But if you need to know if the weave structure works or what the set should be or how hard to beat it, or that, then you need mm -hmm. yeah. a whole, a, you know, 12 need by 12. a proper, proper piece of cloth. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. That's, that's another good one. And it's, you know, it's a discipline. It's uh mm hmm Yeah. Yeah. So, you remember the Teach a, weave, Teach a Friend to Weave contest? Oh, yes, I do. Well, I was one of the judges in the first round of that. Mm hmm And the other two judges were Sharon Alderman and Catherine Wartenberger. Okay. Both of them are far more formal weavers than I. Yeah. And I learned a lot in that. And for instance, I learned that their framework for overshot is that the pattern has to be squared. You've got to have the same number of really? warps and wefts. And if the pattern isn't squared, then you mark it down. Huh. And my idea was, but what if somebody wants it taller? Right. You know, then that's fine. So it was a good balance of judging, but mm -hmm. I learned a lot from them about things that hadn't been in my original teaching about formal, traditional, this is how weaving is supposed right, to be. Right, right. So, well, that's good. supposed to be is sort of a bear, isn't it? And do yeah. you think that gets in people's way? Absolutely, yes. I think, I think that it can be a help. And in terms of finding out how things can work, do work, that kind of thing. But I yeah. think no, I, it's not necessarily useful to be locked into it. Yeah. Because if it's if it stifles your creativity, then feel free to weave outside the box. Yeah, and I, play and around. I, yeah, and I, you know, one of the things that has always stayed with me is I saw an overshot piece you did mm -hmm. way back, where instead of having the pattern yarn be fat, uh -huh. you had the pattern yarn be skinny, huh. and the plain weave yarns be fat. Fat. And it was so interesting. Do you remember doing that? I don't. It sounds dreadful, but <laughs> <laughs> no, it really but it would be really worked. interesting. It, yeah, it really worked. It was fascinating. Hmm. That's... I kind of, I like the idea that it would be kind of a secret. Yeah, yeah, because... almost like a shadow. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, it, it, it was quite lovely. I remember mm -hmm. it well. Yeah, I think now, but that reminds me too that another another useful thing to know is that if you're combining color and pattern color will win. So if you weave a plaid overshot, you're not going to see the overshot. You're going to see the plaid. No, that's that's uh, probably true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or any other pattern. Yeah. Um, you need to put those together, but not... I had somebody come for a workshop one time for summer and winter, and 
they had put a, you know, 10 color warp on there. Mm-hmm. Boom, and I thought, oh, I forgot to say, make it all one color. True, because you just wouldn't see. You didn't see the pattern. Would, wouldn't see what The structure, yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. So what else do you have on your mind? Okay. Um, let's see. If you're, when you go to buy reeds, they're expensive enough that most people don't own a full set. And you can read we forever with only one reed, but then you're limited to the yarns you can use. So if you want to get the most out of it, buy three reeds that are not multiples of each other. Like, so, like what? Like five, eight, and ten. Mm-hmm. Five dent, eight dent, and ten dent. But, or, but five and ten are multiples. You're right. You did that wrong. Five, eight, and twelve. Okay. Five, eight, and I'll twelve. Buy that. Or six, ten, and fifteen, or mm-hmm. four, five, and six. And if you expect to be weaving with fat yarns all the time, then go for the four, five, and six. If you expect to be weaving with fine yarns all the time, then go for ten, twelve, and fifteen, something like that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But if you're going to be doing a mix of things, get a wide one like a five, and a fine like a fine-ish like a twelve. Yeah. Guatemala doesn't use anything. Twelve would be enormously huge in Guatemala. That would not even be. Yeah. There isn't even any such thing. So it all depends on what you're going to be doing. Right. Okay. You don't have to have a ball winder. And in fact, in the last few years, what I found is that a lot more yarns are not coming in skein skeins. They're coming in pull skeins. So people don't even really need swifts necessarily. Mm-hmm. But it, back in that the day. Be, is that, be, you mean weaver's yarns are coming that way? Or, yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, so if it's coming on, a, if all you buy is coned yarns and yarns that are in pulse gains, then you don't need a swift or a ball winder. Right, right. But if you are buying yarn that's, or making yarn on, that you're spinning yourself mm-hmm. and it's in a skein skein, then you can go from the swift to the warping board or from the swift to the bobbin winder and you don't have to have a ball winder. If you do, that's fine. You'll use it. Yeah. But if you're trying to... So what would you say is the most important piece of equipment, aside from a loom? The loom and the warping board or yeah. a warping mill. Right. Um, for me, it would be a swift. Okay. If I wasn't getting that kind of yarn, probably then the bobbin winder. If you're weaving yarn that goes on bobbins, you're not just using yeah. stick shuttles. What about the shuttle? There are stick shuttles, which are very functional and awkward to weave with and slow. Mm-hmm. You'll get a better salvage if you can use a boat shuttle, if you're doing the kind of weaving that allows for a boat shuttle. Mm -hmm. And get one that you like the feel of, the heft of it, how the bobbin spins around on the shaft. Yeah. Um, I mean, they all work, but all cars work too. You just need to find (laughs) the one you like best. Um, And so, and if, and I would suggest having two to four boat shuttles anyway, because sometimes you weave things where you're changing colors and you don't want to have to keep taking the bobbin out, changing it, taking the bobbin out, especially if it's something for with two, only two, sure. two yeah. colors. Yeah. So I, I have lots of shuttles, but, um, but I think probably four is enough for almost anybody and two is enough for a lot of people. Yeah. So, okay. But lots of bobbins. You don't need very many shuttles, but you need a lot of bobbins. True, yeah. And, and a good bobbin winder. Yeah, assuming that you're not going to wind perns or the, those little paper things except for that you, oh, right. you, you need a good winder yeah right yeah yeah what else do you have to to share what other wisdom comes to mind if you don't get a shed if you've got your loom all warped and you sit down to weave and the shed's not opening up go to the back of the loom and see if you forgot to go over the back beam and when I say that don't feel embarrassed because you're obviously not the only person who's ever done it or I wouldn't know about this if you're weaving on a floor loom and you sit down to weave, you've just gotten it all warped, and you sit down to weave, and you step on the treadles, and you have almost no shed, then go around to the back of the loom and look to see if you've forgotten to go over the back beam. If the threads are going from the eyes of the heddles downhill toward the warp beam, where it's all round around, but it forgot to go horizontal and then down, then, first of all, there are a lot of us out there who have done that. Don't be too embarrassed. And second, you don't have to unthread anything. You don't have to untie anything. What you do is lift the back beam off of the loom, which you may need to unscrew something or you may not. Lift it off, 
pull it out, slide it underneath the warp, lift the whole warp up, and put it back on. Oh, good. And you're in business. <laughs> yeah. Good. It's easy if you know that. It's a, well, and if you can get your back beam off, because some, I, th I think some looms wouldn't lend themselves to I that, think would they? I think... Some of them, it's a it's a bigger screw to take it off. Okay. But I I haven't I don't think I've ever seen one that you couldn't do it. Okay. Well, that's a that's a I great think. fix. Do you have any yeah. other great fixes for stupid problems? Um, if you are if you have an eight harness loom, you're threading a four harness pattern, you run out of heddles. You don't need to move the heddles. Treat harness five as if it was one, harness six as if it was two. Mm -hmm. Seven is three and eight is four, and you just keep threading. You, it's good to know about this in advance and make sure you've left a bunch of heddles right. on one side. But then when you tie up harness one, tie up one and five. And when you harness, tie up harness right. two, tie up two and six. And then just keep going so you don't have to change your heddles at all. Oh, that's good because changing heddles can be a real pain. It can. If you've got a good open floor space, it's not too bad. You lift the whole thing out, slide things around. Yeah. But I've also done it many, many times, and that probably comes from a lot of practice. There are natural-born rug weavers and natural-born lace weavers, i found. And it doesn't matter which one you are. Just figure out which one you are so that if you're weaving the other thing, you'll know to either beat harder than is natural to you or lighten up. Yeah. Um, I'm amazed looking at people who've never woven in their lives and they sit down the loom and they either immediately bang the hell out of the thing or they're so gentle because they're afraid they're going to destroy it that they just creep forward. Yeah. So yeah. I don't, I'm, I've woven a bunch of rugs and saddle blankets, but it's not easy for me. It's very hard. I'm, I'm a natural born lace weaver. Okay. Well, just, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. I just don't like beating that hard. <laughs> I do it if I have to. No, but that's your nature. You're, that's my nature. Yeah, I'm such a gentle, a person. gentle person. Right? You're a gentle person, yes. Yeah, right. <laughs> so here are the most important ones. One is, when you're upset, hide your scissors. <laughs> okay? Or give them that's to somebody scary, else and tell them not to give advice. them back to you for a while. Right, because... Because, because you're going to poke yourself in the eye? I mean, no, because you're going to cut your warp. Oh. <laughs> you're going to hide your scissors because you're going to do something thinking you have to repair it or something's drastic or you get mad or you get upset and a cut thread is a cut thread that's really hard to fix yeah. almost anything can be fixed that's one of the beauties of weaving almost anything can be fixed some things are not worth fixing mm -hmm. and you need to decide which is which but if you've just run the scissors through your warp that's pretty much the end of the day yeah so when you're upset go hide your scissors go for a walk or when you're confused i had a terrible terrible threading disaster one time. I had like six inches that I had just left out. Oh. And so I went for a long walk. And on that walk, I got the solution to the problem. And it turned out to be a pretty easy fix. But if I had tried to force myself or force it or do something right away, it would not have been a pretty picture. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Same idea. And maybe the final thing is, it's only yarn. <laughs> You know, it's, we forget that because we're so wrapped up in this is a present for my favorite grandchild or my aunt or my person I love or my something. And I have so much invested in how I designed it and how I planned it and how long it took to set it up and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. It's only yarn, people. And it's not going to ruin your life if it doesn't happen the way you want. That is wise. That is wisdom. And that can make a lot of things go better. Yeah. Well, thank you, Deborah. You're welcome. This has been interesting and revealing. And fun. And fun.